Hi, everyone. Um, what a great day this is. It is so exciting to be here with you, and I just feel such incredible gratitude to Fleur and Rob and uh, Nicholas and Noel over there who's done all these beautiful slides and, and uh, Bronwyn and so many other people who have put their hearts into this and believed that we could do something new together. And it's just really exciting to be with you today. So thank you is the first thing I want to say. Um, Really, when we started this project now seven years ago, can you believe that? It's, we never, I think, thought we'd be here today. And so for some of you who weren't with us seven years ago, I thought I would just tell you quickly the story of how this thing began, because I think it captures what it's really about. So in 2011, um, I, as, as Rob mentioned, I'm an anthropologist as well as a lawyer. And I was doing field work uh, with lawyers in the financial markets in Tokyo. When on uh, March, in March of 2011, you may recall, um, there was a terrible earthquake, followed by a tsunami, followed by a nuclear disaster at Fukushima Daiichi plant. And um, I can tell you that um, for the people that I worked with, um, lawyers, regulators, high-level politicians, the elite of the universities, of society at large, and also, I have to admit, for myself, a lot crumbled that day, along with the buildings. Um, a sense of, how could this happen? How could something like this happen here in Japan, where we thought we had such good regulatory structures? We thought we had safety. We thought we could trust the system to protect us. And yet, people are dying in camps up in the mountains, um, removed from their homes. And we can't stop the disaster. And, um, and we started to just have questions, conversations of a kind that I had really never had with those people that anthropologists call their informants, which just means their collaborators, their friends, about you know, the doubts that we had about what we uh, thought we knew, and the blank spots in our own methodologies and our ways of thinking about the world, and the points of disconnect. And we started to realize that that disaster was really a product of silo thinking. The f it wasn't the fact that no one could have predicted Fukushima. It was the fact that the activists couldn't speak to the nuclear specialists who couldn't necessarily speak to the regulators. And certainly, you know, something as international as a disaster like that, because, of course, the plant was an uh, American plant. The nuclear uh, waste and, uh, was going to be going all over the Asia-Pacific region and even back to the United States. Something as international and multidisciplinary as that had to be understood from multiple perspectives at once. Our world, the, the, a crisis like that was a product of interconnection and disconnection at the same time. And that that kind of uh, disconnect, silo thinking, actually was costing lives, quite literally. And so, as we thought about this, we began to say to ourselves, well, gee, this isn't the last time something like this is going to happen. Another disaster will be coming, another crisis. Maybe it'll be environmental. Maybe it'll be a trade war. Maybe it'll be, God forbid, a security crisis. At that time, will we feel, as a group, that we've done everything in our power to alleviate that crisis? What would it take for us to be prepared? And so preparedness became a question for us. But of course, as we thought about that, um, and we started to think about reconnecting all of the, the different disciplines and the nations in a conversation, we also began to realize that the problem wasn't just a problem of stitching together the different pieces of knowledge that needed to be connected. That, um, so Professor Yuji Genda, who heads up this project in Tokyo, loves to tell a story about the tsunami um, in which, um, you know, in Japan they had, uh, excellent preparedness drills for kids inside the schools, what to do if a tsunami comes. And these were the products of the best uh, uh, urban planning knowledge, environmental knowledge, education knowledge, psychology, economics, um, and so forth. And it had been boiled down into a very good drill of what kids should do and practiced again and again. And on that day, um, there was one school in particular in Fukushima in which, in which the kids saw the water coming, and they got into their pre preparedness drill and decided, you know, get, get ready, get ready to do it. They've got that, that checklist in their head of what to do. And half of the kids said, wait a minute. Something's different than what we thought. That water is coming in a different direction. Maybe we abandon the checklist. 
And the other half of the kids said, no, 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 we've been told what to do. We follow the checklist. We stick with the plan. So these primary kids, school children split into groups. And half of them followed the plan. And unfortunately, those kids find, found themselves in a shelter which ultimately was inundated by water and they perished. And the other half abandoned the plan and ran up into the hills and were saved. And Professor Genda loves to talk about that, to say, you know, to prepare people, it's not just a matter of making the best plans. It's about preparing the soul, preparing the person to be flexible, to be imaginative in that context, to be nimble, to be able to think uh, collectively and, and creatively and with empathy and curiosity in the moment. And so he um, has really pushed us to realize that the mission of Meridian 180 can't just be about producing better knowledge. It's also going to be about producing ourselves as better and different people with the kind of empathy and curiosity of spirit and risk-taking spirit that our world so desperately needs. So um, given that, you know, obviously there are tremendous barriers to doing this, right? I mean, we all know that um, uh, we, those of us who work in universities um, uh, know that universities are not nimble, <laughs> creative places all the time, right? That, that in our institutions um, create walls, that um, we're often trained to, uh, to, to, to stay the course and not to try new things. We're rewarded that way. Um, and, um, and that there are all kinds of barriers, language, culture, discipline, all kinds of problems to doing the kind of work that Meridian wants to do. And in particular, let me just mention um, um, the way we've been thinking about the arc of research. So if you think about the way ideas get produced, from the moment an academic has a spark of an idea, to way to the other moment when that work finally is produced and gets handed off to next users and hopefully makes an impact in the world. We at the university have a well-honed, well-developed system for doing that middle chunk of that work. We know how to produce a hypothesis and collect the data and test the data and then vet that through a peer review process and go out and get that piece published, right? But where does that spark come from? Where do we get the original hunch? You know, we don't really talk about it very much. Where does it come from? And if you think about uh, how much investment we make in that middle chunk. In my field of anthropology, it can take 10 years to go from the moment you produce the idea to the final product. It's a big investment for universities to make. Maybe we should think about making sure that our hunches are as creative and participatory as they can be. Because of course, that's a moment when we're, perhaps we can bring the world in and people can tell us, these are the questions we need answered. These are the problems we'd like you to address. Here's where we, we as a society can come together on that end and also on the other end. When we hand things off to next users, I remember when I wrote my first book, I was a baby professor. I remember, you know, I published my first book. I thought it was really great. And I published it, and I thought, oh, the world's going to change. And I waited. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, nobody read it, right? So the question, and, and I, as a professor, wasn't really, uh, I didn't have the skills. I didn't have the context. I didn't have the technologies to take my ideas and translate them and hand them over to next users. And so one of the things that I think Meridian 180 can do, because we're a partnership not just of universities and scholars, but of people in the world, is both to develop those hunches collaboratively and bring the world in on one end, and also develop a collaboration that gets ideas into the hands of next users on the other end. So how do we at Meridian 180 do this? Well, we're kind of a curious thing. We're, first of all, an alliance of universities. So New South, University of New South Wales, our newest partner, we're just delighted, yay. Um, University of Tokyo, Keio University, Ritsumeikan University, uh, uh, Iwa Women's University, uh, Northwestern University, and many more coming online soon. So we're an alliance of universities who are dedicated to changing university culture and working together to really allow those newest ideas that need to be born to emerge collectively. Because the genius of our time is a collective collaborative genius. It's not an individual genius anymore. But it's all, we're not just an alliance of universities. We're also a membership organization. Um, uh, we invite, uh, of course, all the scholars at our home institutions to join us, but also people who are not part of those universities, and also people who are not professors. We, we really, really welcome uh, 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 professionals and artists and 
uh, you know, people from the creative fields and, um, and activists and government officials. And so it's a place where all segments of society can really come together and we can work on breaking down that wall between the university and the rest of the world. So we're a membership organization and we do a number of things. We have a platform online in which we hold our conversations in multiple languages because we really believe that language is one of those barriers that persists uh, and, and in keeping us from having those, that kind of dialogue that we need to have. So right now, uh, all of our conversation is translated into Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and English, and we're hoping to add more languages soon. We also have live conferences, events. Rob was just talking about one of them. Um, we have, and, and we sponsor global working groups in which scholars and practitioners and activists from a variety of fields can come together and work on a problem very intensively and pull it all the way through to policy outcomes where it can impact the world. Um, so, so that's the, and, and, and as, in terms of our governance structure, we're purposely a very democratic uh, and flat organization. There is no agenda. There, I always like to say we have people on who could get arrested on both ends of the political spectrum in our group. <laughs> we are really, um, really open to all points of view. It's our commitment to, uh, to really not leading with a singular agenda or set of ideas, but rather to providing a platform for people to connect with one another. Um, so just to give you a little example, one of our initial projects uh, was on central banking. We brought together central bankers from around the world. We also brought together act activists who uh, protest against central bankers. We brought together academics, people from different fields. And as, as the conversation developed first online, it got focused then uh, into a more specific question that emerged from the group, which was, what about politics and central banking? Then we had a series of uh, working group meetings in different, in different renditions that really worked on that question. And eventually, it produced a, a book that is aimed at the public and as well at, um, at, uh, at central bankers themselves, looking at how the public can engage more actively with central banks. So a kind of new perspective really hasn't been in the debate about central banking at all. And I don't think any of the members of the group would have been able to come edit on their own. It was really the collective work that allowed that, that, to, that to emerge. So, um, so what does this mean for all of you? Well, first of all, so glad you're here today. I know each of you has five other places you should be and really, really grateful for your time today. And I hope this can be the beginning of us engaging much, much more. So what, what's in it for you? Um, I think the first thing is uh, a, a, a way for you to reach a new community of, of, of collaborators, of interlocutors. Uh, a way for you to take your ideas and uh, give them a global uh, audience through the project itself, but also a way for you to meet people who you wouldn't necessarily have a way to connect with and to, um, to, to really have an intensive kind of conversation with them that you wouldn't have anywhere else. So for example, um, one of our members uh, in Tokyo um, uh, is a, uh, a, a principal of a large uh, investment bank. And he said to me once, you know, I wish that there was someone in the creative world, a, a dancer, a theater person that I could talk to because performance is so important in finance, but I wouldn't even know how to find such a person. And through Meridian 180, he could find such a person and have those conversations. And then he took those ideas back and kind of turned them into something he sold his clients and was very happy. So, <laughs> um, but so that's, you know, those kinds of connections that would be very hard for you to make, we can help you broker. That's one thing. The other piece, I think, is um, uh, kind of feedback on your work that you might not get elsewhere. I, Fleur likes to say, you know, it's what we all wish peer review could be, right? The idea of being able to put out your ideas in a, in a safe space, uh, a space of experimentation and questioning and creative evaluation and have somebody say, you know, that's really interesting as an economic argument. Here I come at it from this perspective, from uh, the health sciences, and I would see a different perspective. Or here's what, a, what I, as a dancer, would have to say about what you do. Or here's what I would say as a politician, right? So to get different voices commenting on your work that you might not have otherwise, and hopefully make the project better and richer that way. Um, uh, a third thing, of course, is this alliance that we're building between our universities from the ground up. You know, most, I think, unfortunately, I'll say now as a brand new university administrator that most alliances between universities start from the top down. 
And in my view, those do not last very well, and they don't produce the kind of richness and outcomes that we hope to find. This is a bottom-up driven alliance of universities based in the traditional, the, the hope and the energy of people who really want to be together. And we as administrators are just here to support it. And I think that's really exciting and new. Um, and then finally, the fourth, and maybe the most important, is a chance to be part of something that I think is going to be really transformative. Um, we heard Julie Bishop talk just now about uh, trust in this world and how important it is. Certainly in my own country right now, we have plenty of challenges and questions about what's happened to our culture and, um, and how do we begin to rebuild. And I think the, kind of, uh, the kinds of connections that we're making through this project with people who are very different from ourselves, who don't, by definition, don't share our, our field, who don't speak our language, who come from a, a different set of institutional contexts than our own, um, these are really valuable. And the knowledge that we're producing together is something none of us could have done on our own. And I, I really believe that we will all look back on 20 years and say, wow, we did that. And we did it together. And it's wonderful. So it's really a privilege to have this opportunity to get to know you and to work with you. And I'm just really looking forward to what the future will be, re, uh, lead we will bring for all of us and just want to thank the leads here at UNSW for the tremendous work that they've done uh, to make this a reality and just thank you friends so thanks very much